Peter. We're in chapter 2, verse 4 through 8. And let's go ahead and read this. Uh, Our text says this morning, As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Let's have a seat and I'm going to open a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the word that you've given us this morning. Um, I thank you that uh, it has been such a joy to go through uh, this section so deeply. I thank you that... um, We've been attentive to your spirit uh, to slow down, to look at this closely, because I believe that we are better for it. Uh, Father, we live in a time of earthly suffering. We live in a time of turmoil, gossip, division, backstabbing, slander. Um, We live in a time where we are persecuted, where we are weary. Father, we have seen injustice. And to be able to know that there are still blessings that we can hold to as believers is refreshing. Father, I would ask that these, uh, that these trials that we will continue to face until the day that we take our last breath would be able to be suffered a little bit better because um, we have taken the time to faithfully look at your word. So, Father, uh, continue to have your way in this service. We submit it to you. Um, this is not our service. This is not my sermon. This is you. And we just want you to do an incredible thing this morning. Um, convict hearts. <laughs> encourage those who need it, correct those who, uh, who need it, even those that might not know, Father. Um, but we ask that no matter what happens, that you would be glorified. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, guys, good morning. I'm Pastor Kevin, and uh, welcome to Forge Church. We are in our series on 1 Peter. Um, we are wrapping up a, a portion of this text, which has been like a sermon series inside of a sermon series. This has been like the inception of sermon series, okay? It's been very neat as we've taken a lot of time looking at these five particular verses and asking ourselves, where are the blessings for the weary Christian? Where are the blessings for the suffering Christian? And I think we found quite a bit of them. Um, and we get to close the series this morning by looking at our sixth blessing this morning. So here's what's, uh, here's what's going to happen. Um, We're going to look at the last two verses of this portion of text, uh, particularly the back half of verse 7, I'm going to call it 7b, through all of verse 8. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. And what we're going to see is Peter lay out this last blessing, and that is the Christian's ability. Just let me just stop there. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, can I just say a couple things to you? Thank you. If you're listening this morning and you don't know Jesus, let me say thank you. Thank you that you're willing to step out of your comfort zone, um, brave the fear, maybe insecurities of coming here or turning on uh, um, the website and our live stream. I thank you that you're willing to listen. I thank you that you're willing to um, question things. But I want you to understand that these blessings are not for you that I'm going to talk about this morning. All right? These are blessings for the Christian. So as you listen, if you don't know Christ this morning, um, listen with jealousy. Listen with jealousy. Let it cause your soul to long for saying that's what I want Um, because this is available to you. Um, God is in the business of saving lost people and uh, if that's you this morning I want you to hear very clearly you are not beyond being saved. For those who would say, no, I am a believer. Maybe this morning as you get done listening to the sermon, you find out that you're not. You've been playing Christian. You've been playing church. You've been wearing the label because your parents were, because you got confirmed or baptized somewhere. And you're going to realize this morning, I do not have the ability to take part in this blessing because I've been living a lie. If that's you this morning, thank you for being honest with yourself. And I hope that happens. I hope that God does an amazing work in this church body and through the viewers that are listening this morning because his text is beautiful this morning. And um, I can't think personally of a better way to wrap up this section of test of this text than by um, looking at simply the gospel because that's what this blessing is all about. This is, <laughs> this is just the pure, unfiltered, unadulterated gospel. And 
don't check out if you're a believer this morning saying, I've heard the gospel. No, no, no. Uh, the gospel is for believers, and I believe that there's going to be a lot that you're going to be able to get out of this this morning. Um, so we're going to take an in-depth look at the sixth blessing, which is truly just the gospel. Um, I hope this morning it hits you very hard, and depending on the condition of your soul, uh, you're either going to get very convicted this morning, or you're going to be very encouraged this morning, but whatever camp that you fall into this morning, I just trust that um, whatever your response is, it's going to end in God being glorified and you being extremely more satisfied in your life. Amen? Okay. Um, I'm a hedonist. Uh, I want more satisfaction, more pleasure in my life. I hope that you do too, but I hope that you start realizing that you can get better pleasure and better satisfaction in looking for the things of God and the affections of heaven than the things of this earth and the affections of this world. Amen? So let's be greedy, let's be pleasure seekers, let's be hedonists, and let's look to see how we can get more of that through Christ and Christ alone this morning. Uh, let me jump into our verse that we're going to be looking at. And that's going to be particularly just verse 7 and 8. So let me go ahead and uh, reread that for us this morning. It says this, uh, But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. I'm just going to leave that up here for the next 5-10 minutes. There's a lot to start with here, but before I can get into um, what we're going to be talking about this morning, which is the sixth blessing, a deliverance from a just destiny, let's just take a little bit of time, let's pull back, and let's just examine the text so we can understand what Peter is um, conveying through this text. We need to understand a little bit better, and then we can dig into how this is such a great blessing for us. So the first thing we're going to start with is his quote right here, and this is a quote from Psalms 114, so if you just want to, uh, I'm sorry, 118, this is from Psalm 118, and it reads, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So what the heck is the psalmist saying here? Um, pretty simply, all the psalmist is saying here is he's going back to that metaphor of the cornerstone. Paul's been, I'm sorry, Peter's been using that throughout his letter. Paul likes to use metaphors of the body. Peter likes to use metaphors of a building. The psalmist as well did the same thing. So it just fits that he would quote this. And what he's simply saying here is he's making the cornerstone a metaphor for what your life is built upon. You don't have to be a Christian to have your life built upon a cornerstone. The bottom line is every single human that has ever breathed has a cornerstone that their life is built upon. You just might know what, you might not know what it is. You might be saying, well, what is mine? Well, you examine your life and you go, oh crap, it's my job. That's the cornerstone of my life. That is a sad and pathetic and very shaky and unstable cornerstone because in one moment you can lose that job. Someone might say, it's built on my health. I'm working at Metroflex Gym as we own this gym and we do outreach there. The most saddest thing that I see is the countless numbers of males and females that come into the facility and their life is built on the cornerstone of fitness. It's their body. It's their, it's their desire to grind and be a, a fitness pro or a bodybuilder. Well, that is their entire life. That is the cornerstone of their life. And one disease or a diagnosis can change all of that, and they have no identity, no sense of self. The temple that they've built, the, idol the idolatrous uh, building that they've built upon this shaky foundation will crumble, and they will be left not knowing who they are and wondering what life has in store for them. So the psalmist is simply saying here that there are some dudes out there, there are some gals out there, well, let's just real, the majority of human history, the majority of human history, has rejected Jesus as the chief cornerstone of God's kingdom and has chosen really pathetic, really sad, really shaky, really unstable cornerstones to build their life on. And what he's saying here is just because these people rejected us does not negate the fact that he still is that chief cornerstone. You can say, well, listen, man, I, I, I don't believe that that's, that is the cornerstone. I think these other ones are just fine. Cool. But simply rejecting truth does not negate truth. Right? Next month is April. You can say, I, I reject that. I don't believe that. It's going to be February again. And more power to you, dude. But uh, your rejection of the truth does not negate the truth. Christ is the chief cornerstone. You either accept that and build your life upon it, you reject it, and you will find that you will be remiss when you stand before God in the kingdom of heaven and realize that you rejected the one thing that a life was supposed to be built upon. That is what that psalm is saying. Then we move into his next quote, 
which is from Isaiah, and this is from Isaiah 8, and it reads, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Uh, this is a, a very poor, no, I shouldn't say poor. This is a very weak translation of the original text. Um, what is being conveyed in this is more of the idea that this stone, you don't just simply stumble, fall down, skin your knee, your mom blows on it, gives it a little kiss and puts a, a little Flintstone Band-Aid on it and then you go back and play. That's not what's being referred to here. What the image that is being conveyed is more of a falling onto a large rock. Um, being, or the other one, having the rock fall upon you and crushing you. This is more of a death sentence. It's either a fatal injury or an injury that leads you to realize that you need to change things. This is not a simple stumbling or falling. This is a crushing. This can be conveyed in a picture of killing, okay? In the context of Isaiah, he's a prophet for the Jewish people when, uh, Jew when the Jewish community, the Hebrew people, were still under a theocracy, meaning that God was their king, okay? Uh, they are living under this. Uh, they have earthly kings still. Um, the kingdom is becoming divided. We have uh, Judea and we have Jerusalem, we have Israel, we have all this, this turmoil within it, and Isaiah and all the other prophets are there to continue to warn people to repent and turn back to God. But one of the things that's very unfortunate, kind of ironic about the Jews at this time, is they are really big on waiting for the Messiah. They always have been. Um, ever since Genesis 3, when the, the, that was the very first um, telling of the gospel when we heard that there would be a Messiah that would come and would crush the, crush the serpent. So their whole, for generations, the whole community of Jewish people have been waiting for the rock. The rock is coming. The Messiah is coming. That was their personal rock, right? Because, because salvation at that time was through the Jews. If you wanted salvation, you would have to come and, and be uh, circumcised and come under Jewish traditions. You could be a Gentile, but you must be converted to uh, a, a Jew, and then you can be part of this beautiful blessing. And they would say, he's our rock, nobody else's. He's ours, he's ours. This coming Messiah, we don't know what he's going to be, what it's going to look like, when he's going to come, but we're waiting, we're eagerly anticipating the rock. And they would say, he's our rock. And then he comes and they say, he's not our rock. Right? He's our rock. He's not yours, Gentiles. Nobody else. This is ours. We're waiting for it. And all of a sudden he comes and he goes, that, that, that ain't our rock. Doesn't look right. That's a bootleg, phony. We reject that. So he's saying, listen, that rock that you've been waiting for is going to make you stumble. Why? Because when they saw him in his very humble appearance in his demure personality. He didn't come uh, with trumpets on a white horse riding in. He came lowly on a donkey. He hung out with, with prostitutes and tax collectors and criminals. He walked around and washed other people's feet. He ate uh, with the unscrupulous of society. He called people to repent. He was lowly. He was not much to look at, and they said, man, this is too much. They stumbled over it. And sometimes we stumble over truth because it's just too hard for us to get our heads around. We're like, I can't accept that. We stumble over it. So he goes, that rock that y'all have been waiting on, it's going to cause most of you to stumble. And, and that's the idea here. He's reminding them by going back to this quote from Isaiah, this prophecy, that Christ will make many people stumble. Only a few will find solid footing on this rock, right? The, the road to hell, <laughs> we're told that is a wide gate and a broad road. In heaven, it's narrow. Not a lot of people enter into it. You go to a funeral nowadays, you'd believe everybody goes to heaven. That's not just the case, man. Many are going to stumble. So then we move into Peter's part. And Peter then comes in through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and says, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. He is now answering the question from Isaiah. Well, why do they stumble? Why do they fall? He goes, well, here's why, guys. They stumble because they disobey the message. And we go, oh, because they're not doing the Christian stuff, right? Like, because they're not uh, using clean language. They're cursing, right? That's what they're disobeying. They're, they're cursing. They're, they're fornicating. Uh, they're, they're drinking. They're... Um, they're not being married, having kids outside of wedlock. They're, 
they're not going to church service, they're not tithing. Dude, that's moralism. Give me a freaking break. They stumble because they disobey the message. It's not that they're disobeying a list of Christian do's and don'ts. They're disobeying the message of the gospel, right? The message of the gospel says repent and believe in Jesus Christ. If you disobey that message, you will stumble. Do you get what I'm saying? We are so stupid in the church today because we come up and we're like, we want you all to act more like Christians. Screw that, dude. I don't want you to act like a Christian. I want you to be a Christian. Be a jacked up, messed up Christian, but be open and honest and own your crap. And then as you love God and as you experience his love, he will bring you greater sanctification because you're going to say, I desire to follow you more. And then all that garbage in your life gets cleaned up. You stop gossiping so much. You stop talking bad about people behind their backs so much because you're like, I love Jesus. Don't focus on the list of do's and don'ts. Focus on the gospel message. That's what will cause you to stumble or not stumble. You get what I'm saying? Does that make sense? You can move a little bit. That's good news. Like There's freedom in that. Like Shake it off. So that's what Peter's doing here, man. But then we have a really difficult part at the end. Um, and I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't state it. And I think some of y'all, maybe some of you that are a little bit more awake this morning are like, hmm, there's something fishy here, pastor. That's what they were destined for. Wait a minute, is Peter saying some people are destined to reject the message? That sounds a lot like this, this idea that's held in some reform circles, not all, but some, um, goes by the name of Calvinism. But it's the idea that some people are born either predestined to go to heaven or you're born predestined to go to hell. Okay? And we go, wow, that sucks. What am I supposed to do with that? Like, so either you just kind of wait, <laughs> you find out. I mean, it, so they, what happens is they read this and they go, man, it sounds a lot like it's talking about this idea that certain people are predestined by God to stumble. And what happens is if you hold to that theology, you interpret scripture through the lens of said theology. And what you end up doing is you do a lot of exegetical gymnastics to make the text fit with your theological presupposition. Did you follow all those words? No, you didn't. <laughs> rewatch it again, rewind it, look it up. Um, but but it's, it's a problem, man, because see, a simple, straightforward read in the text would read like this. The fate of those who reject the cornerstone has already been predetermined or predestined. The fate of those who reject has already been predetermined. Not the people. The people that reject Jesus have not been predetermined. The consequences of rejecting Jesus have already been predestined or predetermined, which means God predetermined before Christ even came what the consequence of rejecting him would be. And that is what? To stumble and fall. But the individual still has to choose whether or not they're going to fall under said predisposed consequence. My friends, there is a danger when you read scripture through the lens of your theological presuppositions. And when you do that, you oftentimes then fail to read a simple, straightforward reading of the text, and you take the text, and you have to twist it, infer things, add to it, presume, because you want to make it fit this lens of your theology. And when we do that, oftentimes we misrepresent the text, and we miss out on what the meaning is. And what it's saying here is, God's already chosen what the destiny of those who reject him will be. It's to stumble. That's what they were predestined for. Are you tracking? Cool, then let me move on, man. So Peter's summing this whole thing up. Basically what's happening here is he's saying a lot of people are going to reject Jesus. Many are going to stumble over him. And for those that do, their destiny has already been predetermined as a consequence of rejecting Jesus is being crushed by Jesus. I like to say we're saved from God, by God, and for God. That's cool, right? We don't like to think of it that way because we like to think, well, God is just, he's, he's at war with the devil and we're being saved from the devil. No, you ain't. <laughs> what makes you think he has that kind of power? You're saved from God. You're saved from God. You need to be saved from God, not from the devil. That's weird, you know, uh, hokey, weird Sunday school stuff where there's this powerful boogeyman trying to get you. You need to be saved from God, and you get saved from God by God. 
And then you get saved by God for God. That's the gospel, my friends. So let's take a look and break this down and figure out how does this whole thing work? How, how do we see deliverance from a just destiny as a blessing, and how does that whole statement even work? Well, to understand this, I think we need to first start by saying, well, what is everybody's destiny? No, it's not, you know, to be a rock star or Bella, my little sweetheart. I see you, sweetheart. Her destiny is not to be on America's Got Talent. I think that's what she wants to do, right, Bella? Is that where you want to be on America's Got Talent, sweetheart? Yeah. Th- listen, that's not her destiny, all right? Like, we, what's my destiny in life? You can wrestle with what's your, maybe, uh, um, what does God want to use you for? That's cool. But when we talk about a destiny, we all have the same destiny, okay? But to understand what our destiny is, we have to first understand what our condition is. Because your destiny is based off your condition. Your spiritual condition determines your ultimate destiny. And it would be wise of us to pause for a moment and reflect on what is our spiritual condition. As I started this morning, there are some of you listening online right now or some of you sitting here right now that presume yourself to be a believer in Christ, but you are not. And I'm hoping that if we can be blunt enough, clear enough, and bold enough, um, you will see that. And we don't do it because we want to be mean and make someone feel uncomfortable. It's because we love someone. If my child was riding her bike off a cliff, I wouldn't gently say, oh, I don't know if this is a great idea, but I don't want to offend you. I would knock her over with the force of J.J. Watts. I would spear her into the ground, breaking her body if I need to, to spare her life. So I don't want to spare your feelings to damn your eternity. Fair enough? If you don't like that, you can find another place that's going to simply tell you you're a snowflake until the day you die and not care about your eternal destiny. But I love you, and I want to see you in heaven with me. Amen? So what's our condition? Um, I can tell you, but I think it's better when we're dealing with something this deep to maybe just go to the Bible. So I'm going to just pop, 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 proof text for you, right? So the first thing is part of your condition is you're a sinner. You're fallen. (gasps) That's, that's not what my mom said I am. She said I'm special. Yeah, sure, you're a special sinner. That little adorable baby that I held up here, like it's cute, but it's a cute, cuddly, depraved creature. Sinful and a child of wrath. You know, mom's like, ah, why you ain't gonna hold more? But like, <laughs> like, listen, man, like here's the deal. Like we're born depraved by nature. We're born sinful. We're born fallen. And if the mom of that cute little baby doesn't believe it, just wait till it gets a little bit older. It arches it back. It screams at you and yells no. And you're like, what did, I didn't teach you that. You don't have to teach sin. It just knows sin, right? Like we just, we know sin. It's natural to our, to our person. We know this because of Romans 3.23. Here's what Romans 3.23 says. C says, coffee time. Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Why is this true? That beautiful little baby was a great sermon analogy this morning. That child has done nothing wrong to deserve to be depraved by nature. Didn't have to be. The curse of Adam fell upon that beautiful child and has fallen upon all man from uh, Genesis 3 on. See what happened was we had very back in the beginning. uh, Man defied the living God. A, A created being that was created for the glory of the creator defied the creator and said, I don't want to to." be in your image. I want to do what I want to do. I want to defy you, even though I have no right to defy you because I am nothing but dust and dirt. I am but vapor, but I'm going to defy the living God. And in doing so, God was loving. And instead of killing that creature immediately for defying him, he showed grace and mercy and he clothed that wretched, pitiful creature. And then he he put that curse upon all of creation, sparing that creature, and then giving his only son as a sacrifice for that wretched, unthankful, ungrateful creature. He did not do what he should have done, which was kill him instantly. He allowed him to live and loved him. But the generational curse that was upon him has been 
brought down through all human history, and we are born into this curse, the curse of sin, which is why we fight against the flesh, and sometimes the flesh wins. We have all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God, and we call this the doctrine of total depravity, and it should help us understand a lot about who we are, and if we can grasp the concept of total depravity, we will be more humble, I believe, in our lives. Um, If you don't believe that you're a really that bad, you're like, okay, I can accept I'm a sinner, but listen, Pastor Kevin, I'm kind of, I like to think that I'm good, Um, that's cute, Uh, it's not true, Um, let me give you proof text from scripture, I'm going to go back to that place in Romans 3, and he continues a little bit before that, previously to Romans 3.23, he says in Romans 3.10 and 12, this is a great life verse, if you want to get like a verse to put up over your wall of your house, Here's what it says. There is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There's no one who does what is good, not even one. I believe Joel Olstein's preaching on that this morning. (laughs) It's a cheap shot. I'm sorry. But man, here's the deal. I I mean, I I, I say it tongue in cheek, but we don't preach that, do we? Why? Because it's kind of offensive, isn't it? Like nobody goes, oh. That was encouraging this morning. So happy pastors preached on Romans 10 through 12. Like, nobody wants to hear that. Um, But here's the deal, man. Nobody's good. Scripture tells us we're all worthless. Man, this is like the anti-American message, right? The American church does everything outside of this. God was lonely without you. And he made you because he just, he needed something to love more. No, he didn't. He was perfectly complete. There was perfect love and fellowship within the Trinity. You're an expression of his love. You were made to love him. He delights in the love that you have for him. And his, his, chief, his chief desire is to see himself glorified. And he wants to invite us into that beautiful, beautiful symphony. It's still hard to accept, though, and I get that. My little boy has a hard time accepting this concept. Um, he's five years old. It's time for him to start learning good theology. So we sat down one day and we talked. <laughs> it was difficult. He's, he's really getting, he's asking more questions, and I'm trying to ease him into it. I don't know what he can understand. And, you know, he's saying things now. He's kind of, be, he's parroting. That's what kids do. They parrot parents, um, which is why we are very careful with when we allow children to be baptized here, because a lot of times your young children, you know, 12 and under, you know, they're professing faith, but they don't really have it. They're just simply regurgitating what their parents are teaching them, right? And eventually they come into their own faith, and, and we love to see that. So we just say, let's use wisdom in that area. But my son's parroting right now, and it's, it's cute, though. Uh, but he's asking questions, and I dig it. He's asking hard questions. And he said to me the other day as I'm sitting in my study working on my sermon, he goes, Dad, he goes, uh, he goes, bad people go to hell, don't they? And I was like, well, yeah, but bad people go to heaven too, son. And he was shook. I was like, yeah, bad people go to heaven, bro. I didn't call him bro. I called him son. <laughs> I, call my, I call him son. I like it. And he says, good people go to heaven, Dad. I said, oh, man, I should have just let it go. But I have a hard time when people say untheological things. And, like, even when kids do it, like, when they say something cute and the parents like, hey, Pastor, look what my kid said. Like, I just bite my tongue. like, oh, I got to correct that theology. It's wrong. My wife's like, he's four. All right, just let it go. (laughs) So, anyways, I look at my kid. I'm like, no, man, good people don't go to heaven. I I said, son, there's no such thing as a good person. But dad, you're good. No, dad's really not good. I'm not good? No, son, you're not good. This was a, I'm not saying I'm a good parent, but I have good theology. And I says to my boy, I says, listen, there's no such thing as a good person. And now he's just like, his world is upside down. And I'm like, no, and I realize I got to back up. I'm like, here's the deal, bro, um, son. <laughs> I said, uh, you can make good choices. And he's like, okay. I said, you can do good things. But I said, you inherently, you are not necessarily, right? I have to change my word. You're, you're not really a good as a whole. You know, we're all bad. We're all bad because the only good is God. God is the only good. And compared to him, we're all bad. Does that make sense? And he's like, ah. Oh. I said, yeah, so it's, it, 
I said, you can make moral choices. And that's why I started losing him, right? And I was like, let's just, let's end it there. But here's the deal. Like, my son was shook with the idea that there's no such thing as a good person and that bad people go to heaven and bad people go to hell because, you know, it's not about, it, God's the only good one. And, and then the idea that there can be people who are morally upright that burn for eternity. Like, we, my kid sh is shocked with that, but there's 55-year-olds that are shocked with that. There's people in the church for 20 years that are still shocked by this because they don't really truly understand that there's a huge difference between making moral choices and being good. Sinful people can be moral, but that means nothing. It's bad people saved by grace that, are, that, that experience the imputed righteousness of Christ and have their sins forgiven that experience eternity with God. So what's the consequence of our condition? Let's go back to Romans 3.23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. All right, so death comes because of sin. We can walk through this. You're a sinner. You're fallen. Here's the deal. You're not good. The wage of sin is death, physical death. We know that when Adam sinned, death came upon the world. And then there was also another death that came. It's called the second death. You're like, that sounds like the Hobbit's breakfast. Second breakfast, which I'm a huge fan of, and I will do after our sermon. But there's a second death. And you go, well, what the heck is a second death, Pastor? Well, thank you for asking me. Please wait your turn. It's in Revelation 21.8. And just fun fact, don't put the S on the end of it. It doesn't sound right. It, there's no S. It's Revelation. Just the more you know. Uh, but here's what it says. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sor sorcerers, idolaters, and all the liars, he's just listen, basically, anybody that's, that's a human. Um, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So sin has a consequence of death. The second death is eternal conscious torment in the presence of God. <gasps> yeah, I mean, like hell isn't like some little thing where Satan rules over like, ha ha, my kingdom, and he tortures you. Like he will be thrown in the lake of fire along with all of his fallen angels and everyone who disobeys God, they will all be judged and it will be in the presence of God. That's a trip, ain't it? Eternal conscious torment in the presence of God. So now the question becomes, all right, Pastor, you said uh, it's a deliverance from a just destiny. I'm on board with the destiny of all mankind. The destiny of everybody who has ever lived is hell. That's everybody's destiny straight out the gate. Straight out the gate. We're not talking about God foreknowing anything. We're just talking about just simply when a human is born in a sinful condition, if they are to stay in said condition, the destiny of all who are born is hell. And now we say, I can accept that cognitively, struggling emotionally, but please tell me how you can possibly say that that is just because it does not seem just at all. And I'm with you, man. I can accept it mentally, but something inside me says, that's not fair. And let's be real, like if you don't feel that way sometimes, like you, you ain't being honest with yourself right now. Like I think we've all done that. We, we might be able to refute that with sound doctrine, but there's, a, there's part of our fallen nature and flesh that goes, that ain't fair. And I don't like it. And it don't seem right. And here's why we don't like it. Here's why it doesn't seem just. Here's why it doesn't seem fair. It's because we as people simply don't like to see ourselves as bad, right? Anybody here like to see themselves as bad? I don't. I would like to see myself as good. Now my son will correct you if you say that in front of him now. His theology is top-notch. But we don't like to see ourselves as bad because we are, we are really good at making comparative judgments about ourselves as people, right? We go, I'm not that bad. Like, compared to Hitler, I'm pretty awesome. And let me just say this right now. If you have to go to Hitler to be able to make yourself feel good about your condition, like, you really need to amp up your morality, okay? But we do that. We're like, well, compared to Hitler, I'm pretty good. And maybe you're like, you know, you, you're like, I don't go that far. You're like, well, compared to a murderer. You know, I'm pretty good. Or compared to a bank robber, I'm pretty good. And that's where I have to stop because that's where my crimes start. So <laughs> I can't really go anymore. I have to go to that one. But we do. We make comparative judgments, right? Compared to that person sitting next to me at service, I'm not bad. That's where it gets ugly when you do that crap. You start looking around this room at people. Compared to him, I'm pretty good. Shut your mouth. That's the height of arrogance. It's the height of pride. How dare you look at somebody else in here, another Christian brother, and say, compared to them, I'm pretty good. No, you're not. You're just proving that you're not. Prideful. Arrogance. We're all worthless. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. 
There is nothing about you that makes you better than anybody in this room. How dare you even think that? We are equally, equally under the same judgment and the wrath of God. We are equally subject to the same destiny, if not for mercy and grace, my friends. Don't you ever think that you're somehow better than someone else by doing this comparative judgment crap. Stupid. Makes you believe a lie. But society tells us what, man? Everybody's basically good. CNN recently re released a report I found online. This <laughs> is really dumb. It said, new study finds people are intrinsically good. I'm like, how did you do that study? Like, what scientific method did you use to determine that people are inherently good? Like, studies have shown, I'd like to know what that study was. But we do, right? We have this idea that there's no bad people, just bad choices. No one is bad. They just had a bad lot in life. Nobody is bad. They just didn't have the right choices. They just made some bad decisions. Nobody's a bad person. So we have a hard time accepting that this could be just. And now even if we can, if we can accept our condition as fallen, even if we can accept the consequence for that condition, um, hell, uh, we still believe sometimes that God is maybe being a bit harsh. Maybe God's a bit unfair. It's a bit extreme that he would sentence people to eternal conscious torment simply because they were born into a fallen condition. Um, the problem is, when we say this, this seems like it's not just. The problem is we, we don't understand justice. We, we, we have this, this struggle because we don't really get what justice is. And not only do we not understand what justice truly is, but we also think we deserve mercy and grace. So I think the best way to do is let, let's clear this up, all right? Um, if I was to invite three people up, all right, I'm not going to do it. You got one dude here. One dude here, and one dude here. And each one of them is going to represent some, right? This dude's going to be mercy. This dude's going to be grace. This dude's going to be justice. And here's how we walk, walk this out. I walk over to this guy. He's mercy, right? What he does is he waits for me to leave the church building, and then he sticks a knife to my throat around the corner, and he robs me. I hope that doesn't happen today. Like, that happened a few weeks ago. Like, I just, it gets really rough, all right? It didn't happen. We got a sketchy church. Uh, so this guy robs me at knife point, takes all my money, and instead of going to the police, I, I, I do nothing. I say, man, that's okay. Forgive you. Go ahead. You can, you can keep what you got. That's mercy. Not getting what you deserve. Now, homeboy over here, I walk over to him after church service. I pull up my wallet. I give him every bit of cash in my pocket. Didn't do anything for it. Didn't work for it. Didn't do a side job for me. Wasn't hustling for me. I just give him all my cash. I'm like, man, you get to have that. That's grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Man, we got to go to the police, man. You're going to jail. You robbed me. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Here's, here's stuff you didn't, you didn't earn, you didn't work for. I just want to give you all my money. It's grace. And then we got homeboy over here. This guy saw me get robbed. He's like, man, he's an easy mark. So he jacks me in the parking lot. He takes everything else I have. And I go, nah. I call the police. Homeboy gets arrested, goes to jail. That's justice. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Justice is simply getting what you deserve. So by definition, mercy and grace, no one deserves them, right? By definition, you can't deserve mercy and grace. When you see someone get mercy, when you see someone else get grace, you have no right to yell not fair because you don't deserve it. It's by definition undeserved. And when it comes to justice and you see justice done, you can't yell unfair to justice because justice is simply getting what is rightfully deserved. Okay? I'm not talking about human justice because sometimes that's, that's really jacked up, right? But true justice. The reality is, it's not that we don't understand. It's not that... We don't think what God is doing is unjust. We don't, we don't have a problem cognitively understanding that it is a right decision. 
If we understand mercy, grace, and justice, we don't have a problem with it. I think the problem is we simply just don't want justice brought down on us. That's where the ruffling comes from. Because we can, in a in an objective, third-party situation, looking at the whole scope of how God works, we would say, yeah, that's right. But when we insert ourselves into the equation, we struggle with it because the reality is we simply just don't want justice brought down on us. We don't want what we deserve, which is justice. What Rather, the case is we want what we don't deserve, which is mercy and grace. Nobody here really truly wants justice for themselves. We wake up in the morning going, I hope I get mercy and grace today. I hope I don't get justice today. And we recoil at the idea that we have to face justice. Right? If you don't, and let me say this, I think it's really hypocritical of us. I think we're all really huge hypocrites with it because here's the deal, man. We, we recognize we're sinful. We recognize we don't do good. We recognize that we reject God, that we sin against him. And somebody's saying, well, I'm a believer. I don't reject God. Well, you reject him every time you choose sin over holiness. Every time you slander instead of encourage, you're rejecting God. Every time you intentionally hurt someone, think a negative thought about someone, you're rejecting God because you're going against what he wants you to do, which is take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. So you can be a Christian, but you're still rejecting God every day when you choose to willingly sin of volition. Tracking? Just let that sit and hurt for a minute because I need to let it sit and hurt for a minute for me. And we're hypocrites, right? Because we, if somebody comes in to your house one night and they brutally, brutally and graphically murder your family, and then after murdering your family in a horrific manner, in front of your face, they burn your house down. You want justice, don't you? Like, you're going to say, well, I want revenge. Well, yeah, revenge is just street justice, homie. But you want justice, right? And if there was no justice, you'd say, man, that's evil. The absence of justice in this case, that would be evil. I demand justice, even if I have to do it by my own hands. That dude's going to pay. When someone offends you, they better pay, but somehow when you offend God, you think it's okay. And that's, that ain't right. That person offended me. There better, there better be justice. So how come when you offend God, we don't want it for ourselves? It's the same thing, man. We can't be hypocrites with this. It's not an issue of not believing that God's actions against sinful humans is just. It's an issue that we don't want justice for our crimes against God. But the reality is, my friends, God must bring justice. He has to bring justice because, as I said before, the absence of justice is simply wickedness and evil. And if God does not bring justice to sinful people we would have to call him not good and that's impossible because god is inherently good it is part of his character so god cannot be not good he has to be good which means he has to execute justice you're like that it sounds confusing let me give you a little illustration here if we had i've done this before and i think it works well there's a judge in town this is not true just hypothetically a judge in town and he just feels empathetic for child molesters so anytime a child molester comes to his court he just lets them go Yes, I'm using something very graphic and that will strengthen your emotions because I want you to see the extent of the wickedness of this. He goes, nah, you good, man. Rough as him on the head. You little scamp. Don't do that again. Get out of here. We would say that guy, needs to, that guy needs to be removed from office. That is a corrupt, wicked, and horrible judge. Do you not understand that if God continued to let people sin go unpunished, he would be just the same? To be a just judge... You have to bring justice. To be a good judge, you have to bring justice. So let's just remove this garbage that, well, God shouldn't bring justice. He should just give mercy and grace. No, he needs to because it is in his very character as a holy, righteous God to be just and impart justice. Does that make sense? To be consistent with his nature, God must bring justice. But here's the crazy part. To also be consistent with his nature, he must offer mercy. And we're going to get to that in a second here. If we can just grasp where we're at so far this morning, um, if we can accept all this to be true, 
that we are sinners destined for damnation, that God is just in pouring out his wrath upon us for eternity, that we do not deserve any mercy, that we do not deserve grace, that we are totally depraved by nature, that we are not good, and we stand completely at his, his, uh, um, his uh, we, we stand completely asking for his mercy, deserving none of it. If we can get this, my friends, I think this is the, the remedy for pride in your life, right? I think this is the remedy for pride in life because if you realize this is who you are, you start looking at yourself differently, you start thinking about yourself differently, and you start treating others differently, you start thinking about other people differently, you no longer have bitterness in your heart towards someone who wronged you. That person is garbage. That person is jacked up. How can they? Whoa, whoa, whoa. When you realize that this is you, you stop looking around at other people and you start looking at yourself and going, what a wretched man am I. Woe is me. I am I am wretched and undeserving. And you stop looking for the planks in others' eyes and you spend all day long with your eye in the mirror going, where's the specs, man? Take them out. If you can't grasp this, you are going to be an arrogant, prideful Christian. And that's not going to be useful to the kingdom, man. Grasp this and you will walk with a lot of humility in your life from here on out. So the question then becomes, well, all right, we grasp all this, but then why would the Christian be delivered? Because, of course, I said the blessing is deliverance from a just destiny. So please, Pastor, tell me, why is the Christian delivered? Well, the easy answer that I think we say all in unison is, well, because of Jesus, right? The bumper sticker, Pastor, says Jesus saves. So why are we delivered? Well, because Jesus. Jesus saves. And I would say you are, you are right in sense, yes. Yes, the Christian is delivered because of Jesus, right? Jesus does save. But, but how and why? <laughs> There's got to be more to it than just simply that. Um, I'm going to say a pretty bold statement here, and I'm, I'm going to double down on it too. I'm not going to back down from the statement. Um, if you don't know how you're saved or what you're saved from, you may not be a Christian this morning. If you don't know how you are saved or why you are saved, what you're saved from, there's a solid chance you're not a Christian. See, if you do not understand that you're a sinner, if you do not understand that you're standing under the just wrath of God, if you do not know that the only escape from God's wrath against you is found in Jesus' substitutionary death, then you don't understand, nor do you know the gospel. And my friends, if you don't know the gospel, you cannot possess saving faith because Scripture tells us in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Jesus Christ. And the message about Jesus Christ is the gospel. If you don't know the gospel, you cannot have saving faith. And the gospel is not simply boiled down to Jesus saves, raise your hand and say a prayer. There are a lot of people that rose their hands, said a prayer, and said, well, Jesus saves. They don't... They, they have no idea that they are sinful by nature, that they are depraved, that they stand on the wrath of God. They need someone to save them from the wrath of God. They have no idea what anything that happened on the cross would except for, well, you know, Sunday school teacher told me that Jesus died for me. I don't know. He t there, there's so much more that I want to get to that in a second. Um, but let me read you this quote. Uh, a guy named C.H. Dodd, he said this, Wrath is the effect of human sin, Mercy is not the effect of human goodness, but it's inherent in the character of God. I'm going to read that two more times. Wrath is the effect of human sin. Mercy is not the effect of human goodness, but it's inherent in the character of God. One more time. Wrath is the effect of human sin. Mercy is not the effect of human goodness. It's inherent in the character of God. What that simply means is that wrath is, wrath is brought on, wrath is bubbled up, and wrath is brought forth by the individual and by the individual's action. But over here, mercy has nothing to do with anything of the individual. Mercy is a completely separate act of God. Wrath is 
because of our actions. Mercy is because of his actions. So how is the Christian saved? Why is the Christian delivered? Because we did this that brought us this, but God did this which gives us this. Do you get that? Why are you saved? Because of extravagant mercy. Because God loves to lavish mercy on people. Because God has mercy as one of his qualities. It is part of his nature. And to not show mercy would not be in line with who he is. Therefore, God must show mercy. And he longs to show mercy. So why are you saved? Because of mercy. It's more than just Jesus saves. Raise your hand. Say the prayer when the music is going. It's understanding who you are, who he is, what you've done, what you should get, and what he wants to give you. You tracking? Up and down? Yeah? But then we got a little bit of a problem here, people. Because if you've been following me, and, you're, and you've, you've caught up, maybe we're still trying to process some of this stuff, you're like, well, wait a minute, Pastor Kevin, you said... If a judge doesn't give justice, he's not a good judge, right? Absolutely, I sure did say that. But wait a minute. If, if we're supposed to get justice from God, which is his wrath poured out on us for all eternity, eternal conscious torment apart from God, uh, in the presence of God in hell, if we're supposed to get that justice and God not giving us justice is, is wickedness and against his character, how is he able to give us mercy? Wouldn't that make justice absent think about that wouldn't it logic let dude be logical about it i said very clearly justice must happen right if god doesn't bring justice he's not a good god and now i'm saying guess what he does he's going to give you mercy <laughs> let's get down from the joy of that and realize wait a minute that's there's a problem here do you not see it if he gives you mercy not justice is justice not absent Come on, man, you got, it's not that hard. Like, follow me, right? Doesn't that make sense? That's a problem. It seems in God's equation of how people get saved, it seems like he's made a bit of a mistake. Lightning. <laughs> but doesn't it? Where's justice then? Because you got me. Like, I'm like, yeah, justice, I get it. And I'm like, hey, mercy. Wait a minute. Pastor Kevin, there's a problem. Either you're wrong or God screwed up. I would pose a third option to you. <laughs> justice is not absent. Justice has been satisfied. And this makes me emotional. Whew. First John 4.10 says this in, this, uh, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Propitiation simply means um, appeasement or a substitution, I'm sorry, or a satisfaction, an appeasement or a satisfaction. He was the propitiations of our sins, which means he satisfied Justice is not absent. Justice has been satisfied. Here's what happened. The wrath of God was upon creation for our sins. Our condition was such that God had to, by his very nature, bring justice through the form of his wrath upon his creation for all eternity. And that's what we had to, to sit under. But because God is merciful and full of love and abounding in grace, he chose not to pour out his justice on us, but he wanted to make a way so that mercy could come to us. And until justice was satisfied, he could not release this mercy, not because it was something he was incapable of doing, but simply because God always has to be consistent with his character. So what God does in one extravagant act of love, my friends, is he, he brings his son to the table and his son hangs naked and ashamed upon a cross for people to mock and spit on. And in one moment, the wrath of God that would have taken me and you eternity to suffer and be poured out on was poured out and taken by Christ in one moment. 
And when the cup of wrath was poured out on Christ, in that moment, something that none of us could have handled, justice was satisfied and mercy was able to come to the table. But without the satisfaction of justice, mercy was unavailable. Justice, my friends, is not absent in God's salvation equation. Rather, justice has been satisfied through the substitutionary death of cross, a, a, a death that you should have faced, a death that I should have faced, a wrath that should be poured out on me for eternity. And he took it in one swift moment. My friends, I pose to you, justice is not absent in God's plan for creation, but justice has been satisfied, which is why we should be humbled and overjoyed by what he did. Jesus made a way to satisfy God's wrath, something that none of us could have done. So why is the Christian delivered, my friends? Well, the Christian is delivered because God chose and he chooses to show mercy instead of justice to anyone who partakes in the work of Christ. And the work of Christ was to become a recipient of divine wrath, to be the one who took on the full cup of God's wrath and in doing so made a way, as I said, for justice to be satisfied, which then released God and allowed him to be consistent with his character and bestow mercy on people without making that justice absent. This is how and why the Christian can be spared from a just or delivered from a just destiny. And it's a beautiful, wonderful, encouraging truth that I don't think we need to spend any more time on. And I think it leads us very well into our audience this morning as we close. We look at our audience and say, okay, pastor, how would these original people that read this letter by Peter, how would they have received all of this as a blessing? Well, it seems pretty stupid to ask that question after what I just said, doesn't it? I go, of course that's a blessing. Yeah, it is. But that's, that's more of a general blessing, right? I, I mean, Peter's writing specifically to unique Christians in a unique situation. Why did he choose this to be something that he wanted to leave them with? Why this? The Holy Spirit is very intentional with the words. Nothing is, is lost. Nothing is just added to fill space like we do when we write letters. Why was this chosen? Why this particular blessing? Well, let's go back and look at the audience who was reading this. These were persecuted Christians scattered throughout the Roman Empire. These are Christians that have been scattered from their homes, possibly through their lands. Maybe some of them have come to saving faith, and they are, they are um, still in maybe a homeland, but they are now strangers and aliens. They're, sojourner, they're sojourners. They are maybe nationally of that particular area, but now that they have a new spiritual kingdom and a new spiritual king, they are not of the world anymore. So these people are, they're cut off essentially. And what's happening is in 62 AD when Peter wrote this letter, uh, the Roman emperor was Nero and Nero was cruel. Nero was hateful. Nero had a bent to persecute all Christians and eradicate Christianity from the land, from the Roman empire, which was a known world. And he did everything in his power to make sure that Christianity was destroyed. And praise God, you can't stop the church. People throughout history have tried, they've tried to squish the church snuff out the church, burn its documents, get rid of its word, but you can't stop the bride of Christ. In all of her inadequacies and all of her ugliness, you cannot stop the bride of Christ. And the church thrived through this period of persecution under Nero. Uh, the church got the last laugh and Nero is facing eternal judgment. But what happened was Nero would do things as horrific as burning Christians alive as human torches to light garden parties, to simply preventing them from being able to be successful in their business, uh, imprisoning them. And if that was enough, like just personally, I'd rather be imprisoned than have to spend my life being slandered and gossiped about. But all of the Christians at that time in their cities, they're being gossiped about. They're being slandered. They're facing imminent death all around them. So these people are, they're suffering. They're clinging to Christ, they're holding to Christ, but they're suffering. So how did this encourage them? Well, I think two ways that this particular reminder was an encouragement to them was because one, Peter recognized that, and, and these people knew that there was probably no escape from the crap that they were dealing with, right? They wake up every morning 
dealing with the same crap from the same petty, bitter people, the same people that are going to slander them, talk bad about them, the same people that want to imprison them, the same people that want to somehow, in their pride and arrogance, snuff them out, push them down, and make them feel bad about themselves. They realized that there was no escape from their, from their lot in life. So Peter's reminding them, brother and sister, Christian, remember that ultimate deliverance is coming. Remember that ultimate deliverance is coming. He also said this to him because death was imminent for the Christian under Roman's empire, under Nero's empire. Death was a very real possibility for all of them. So he's also reminded them and encouraging that there is no reason to fear death at all. Death is the ultimate deliverance in a healthy way for the believer. So how does this apply to us today? I think there's a lot that we could take from it. My friends, listen, um, I want to lay out something for you that I'm going to pose, but um, let this sermon and the text hit you however is faithful. Whatever God is stirring up in you is right, and that is okay. But if you're still struggling to figure out how does any of this apply to you, <laughs> let, me, let me pose this, man. Um, what we preached this morning is the opposite of the modern message of Christianity. The modern message of Christianity is that uh, if you come to, to Jesus, you will find earthly relief. If you come to Jesus, you will find earthly deliverance from your problems. Come to Christ and he will make your life better. Come to Christ and he will, you will experience a revival in your finances. You will experience a healing in all of your relationships. You will gain favor with your employer. Your bank account will flourish. Your health will get better. I even heard one famous pastor, let me not use that word, one famous speaker who said, claim good looks in the name of Jesus. And I said, dang, I wish I would have known that a long time ago. Because <laughs> I am suffering. <laughs> See, this is, a, this is a crap message, man. Scripture only promises relief, escape, and deliverance upon death. And scripture always speaks about how our life on earth and our time on earth will oftentimes be unpleasant. It frequently speaks of that. If you don't believe me, let me read you some scriptures. First one is uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 23. Paul writes this, For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, Now if I live on in the flesh, if I live on, Dude's not even like trying to make that. He's not even claiming that in the name of Jesus, right? He'd be told he doesn't have enough faith. Now, if I live on the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. And then he says, I don't know which one I should choose. Sounds a little bit sadistic, Paul. He goes, I'm torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Paul talks about he longs to be with Christ. He recognizes that this world is full of suffering. He longs to be with Christ. He sees it's far better. That's very much not what we hear preached oftentimes or sold in the bookshelves. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2. Here's Paul again. For we know that if our earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal dwelling in the heavens, not made with hands. Indeed, we groan in this tent. Indeed, we groan in this tent. He is affirming that groaning is part of the human experience. It is a righteous and a good groaning. It is the groaning of one who knows that his rightful place is beside his creator. It is a groaning that longs to be apart from this wretched body that I'm chained to, that pulls me into sin, that suffers sinful people, and it's a groaning to be able to be delivered from it and to be with Christ where I know I can have sweet satisfaction. Romans 8, 18, consider our present sufferings. I consider our present sufferings insignificant compared to the glory that will soon be revealed to us. I believe if one of our modern prosperity teachers were to hear Paul say that in the flesh, he would say something like, well, Paul, you're not winning. You need to claim your victory in Jesus, Paul. Right? You're not walking in the fullness of who you're supposed to be, Paul. 
You need to speak to that sickness. Shut up. Shut up. That's garbage, man. Romans 8, 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Gro so it's, we're, being, we're being told that all of creation, even unbelievers, check that out. Even those who don't know Christ are inwardly groaning because everyone knows inherently that there is just something not right with our current place here on earth. Whether you reject the cornerstone and you think, no, nah, I'm, I'm a naturalistic atheist, man. There's still this groaning because there is something that you know is not right. This doesn't feel right. Why does this not, why am I not fully satisfied? Why, why do I feel not 100% at peace? Even as a Christian, I'm not fully satisfied because this is not supposed to be your eternal place or condition. Our eternal place and condition in Lot is to be with Christ to be with God in a new heaven and a new earth in a new body where we rejoice with each other and we actually love each other well. My friends, the application for us is we need to understand that there is no escape from the evils of this world. There's no way to ensure that we will never experience pain and suffering. It's part of the human experience. It's part of a fallen world. Um, and our time our energy and our efforts should not be spent trying to run away or escape or protect ourselves from the difficulties of a fallen world, but rather we should spend our time, our energy, and our efforts reminding ourselves and encouraging others within the body that deliverance is coming, reminding ourselves and fellow believers that death should not be feared and that groaning to be at home with Christ is a right attitude to have because it reveals a right heart that longs to be with the right cornerstones. You get what I'm saying? Let me dismiss you with this thought. Um, my friends, there is only two options when it comes to Jesus. He is either your savior or he's going to be your judge. Um, everyone in this room, everyone that's listening online right now, uh, you will either face wrath or you're going to face mercy. That's it. You're either going to face justice or you're going to face deliverance. Uh, Peter makes it very clear in our passage this morning uh, that the stone that upholds some for others will be an instrument of destruction. That's your choice. Is Christ the stone that upholds you or will he be the stone that crushes you and ultimately leads to your eternal destruction? Um, so the challenge to you this morning is I want you all to ask yourself very honestly, have you made that stone the foundation of your life? Does that stone, which is Christ, uphold you? Does he steady you? Or have you rejected that stone and have you built a life for yourself apart from it? And will you, because of that choice, eventually see that very same stone crush you and grind you into dust? And if that's you, if you can recognize that, then I would say you've already heard his word this morning. I would implore you to repent and believe in Jesus. Not the Jesus made by your own hand or that's preached in some churches across America, but the true Jesus that we, I believe, represented well today. The Jesus that is God's chief cornerstone. The Jesus that is the only escape from the wrath to come. The only source of grace and mercy. The one who satisfied justice so it would not be absent when mercy came. I would implore you to repent and believe in that Jesus this morning. And do not waste time. Do not meander on this decision. Um, but reach out and, uh, and see your life be changed for the better. Um, now, if you find yourself this morning saying, man, my life is firmly built upon him. He is my cornerstone. He's holding me fast to himself. Then I'd like to leave you with this bit of encouragement. Um, brother and sister Christian, please hold on. Uh, please suffer longer. Please endure wicked people, even other Christians. Endure them well. Show them mercy. Show them grace. Endure suffering on this earth. Not simply better, but do it with hope. Hope that comes from knowing that uh, a greater wrath is coming than what you're experiencing here on earth from people, and that wrath that is coming will not touch you because Christ has provided an escape for you. You have been delivered from the wrath to come. 
So hang on, hold on, suffer longer, run a little bit more, and don't stop. And understand that uh, this deliverance is not because you deserve it, but it's because God is merciful, God is full of grace, and that uh, he has brought all this to you because it pleases him. It pleases him to see his name made famous through grateful people who are humbled by what they receive from a just, righteous, holy God. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for a chance to be able to worship you this morning in truth. Thank you for a chance to be able to worship with your people, and I thank you for the message that you brought forward. I thank you for just the powerfulness of the gospel. I thank you that it is a message that we can hear over and over, but every time we hear it, we, we learn more from it. Uh, Father, please heal hurts that anyone is experiencing here from, from this world, um, even hurts uh, that will never be amended by the individual. But, uh, Father, help us to be able to find healing those, knowing that, Lord, we have hurt you far worse than anyone has ever hurt us. We have rebelled against you far worse than anyone has ever rebelled against us. We have rejected you harder than anyone has ever rejected us. Yet you offer us mercy instead of justice. Uh, may we show that we are truly recipients of mercy by lavishing that on the people around us. Help us to walk with more confidence, greater humility, and deeper lasting hope because of your Son. May us all in Christ's name.